Churches of Christ present Speaking the Truth in Love, a program bringing you life's answers from the Word of God. This program is brought to you by the Churches of Christ in the KAIT TV viewing area. A list of those churches will be scrolled across the screen at the end of the program. Each of these congregations extends to you a warm welcome and invites you to come visit and study with them about the great salvation that Jesus Christ made available to all of us. If you have any questions about your salvation or any other Bible subject, feel free to contact any of the Churches of Christ that are in your area. My name is Greg Cooper and I have the privilege of working with the Lord's Church at Strawberry. And today I'd like to share with you a lesson entitled The War and the Congregation. If you were determined to defeat an enemy, what would you do? If you were determined to overcome something, if you were over, uh, willing to overcome anything, what would you do? If beyond doubt your enemy did something guaranteeing you certain defeat, but in your hatred for your enemy you refused to surrender, what would you do? If you didn't want to give in to that certain defeat, then exactly what could we do? If you preferred destruction to surrender, what would you do? In those three questions, we describe Satan's predicament. Satan was determined and is determined to defeat God's work. Satan failed, but he didn't quit. When Jesus died and was resurrected in submission to God's will, Satan was irreversibly defeated. He knew it. He knew he had been overcome, yet he hated and still does God so much that he refused to surrender and acknowledge his defeat. So what did Satan continue doing? What does Satan continue to do today? He continued resisting God and still resists God rather than surrender to him. Can Satan hurt God personally? Of course not. Then what can Satan do to go cause God pain? He can hurt those that God loves. He can hurt those that God created. He can hurt those that are part of the family of God. Satan's activity since Jesus' death and resurrection has been limited to causing misery to those on earth who are dedicated to God and to His will. He can do that in the lives of those who surrender to God and in congregations of Christians committed to surrendering to God's will. So how long will Satan continue this pointless yet certain resistance until God destroys him by casting Satan into hell. 
Satan's resistance against God and his purposes on earth will continue until God destroys Satan as a being. I, I'm a firm believer that Satan works on us daily. I believe that he's in this world because God's Word says he's in this world. And I believe that he tests us and that he tempts us to give in to his temptations. And Satan makes temptation look good to us. It may, he makes temptation look like it's something that we should desire because he wants to take us away from the God that loves us. He wants to take us away from the God that cares about us. He wants to take us away from the God that has offered us his son and his salvation. Paul writes something very poignant to the church in Corinth in his first letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 beginning in verse 25 for he, speaking of Christ, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death for he has put all things in subjection under his feet but when he says all things are put in subjection it is evident that he is expected uh, who put all things in subjection to him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself also will be subjected to the one who subjected all things to him, so that God may be all in all. So we are subjected to the Word of God. We are subjected to the laws of God, to the commands of God, and what he's commanded us to do. And he says that the last thing to be overcome is death. And we know through the Word of God, we know that Jesus overcame physical death. He overcame that horrible death on the cross so that you and I can overcome our separation from God through our sinfulness. We are sinful and we fall short of the glory of God. But because of Jesus and because of the work of God, we can overcome that temptation in spite of what Satan is doing to us and in spite of what we uh, have done in our lives. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 14, John writes, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. So we see here in Revelation that this death, this Hades, this uh, Hadean realm, that's the lake of fire. And we know that the lake of fire is what God has established and what God created for the devil and his followers. We also know that if we aren't faithful and obedient unto God, that we're going to share the same fate as those that, that God created hell for. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10, a little before that verse, says, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. So we see the contrast here between heaven and hell. We see the war that's going on today, even today, as we think about what's going on in our lives. We know that good will overcome. We know that good will triumph over evil. But Satan is going to take as many people down with him as he can. There is this war going on, and it's a war for our souls. And we know that God is going to be victorious. We know that God is going to overcome Satan. But God has given Satan the ability to roam this earth and to tempt us and to draw us away if we choose to be drawn away. Satan will resist God and will resist his people until God destroys him. Satan will never surrender to God. Only by forcible removal resulting in destruction will Satan cease his resistance against God. At times he'll focus his resistance against God in the life of a person and at times he will focus the resistance in the activities of a congregation. Uh, this lesson focuses today on Satan's resistance in a congregation. We know as the Lord's people, we know as the church that God is in control of our lives, that he's doing everything that he can in order for us to be right with him. And we see sometimes in congregations that there's strife. We see sometimes in congregations that there's division. And understand, brethren, that this division and this strife comes from Satan. God is not divisive. Everything that God says is true. Everything that God does is right. Everything that we know as part of God is good. So when we see these things that are happening to congregations, and we see congregations closing doors all the time, when we see these things that are happening to congregations, we must know that Satan is at work. And we must do everything that we can do to fight the war. As Christians, we shouldn't be surprised when uh, Satan is actively at work in any congregation. You know, if he could deceive Eve, then he could deceive us. 
Paul warned Christians to be aware of deception. As he writes to the church at Galatia, in Galatians chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, it says, For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone and not in regard to another. Examining ourselves is something that we need to do on a daily basis. You know, we focus on that a lot as we surround the Lord's table on the first day of the week in examining our lives. But we need to examine ourselves daily. We need to look at everything that we're doing in context with what God would have us to do. Paul goes on to write in Galatians 6 verses 7 through 10, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the, the one who sows to the Spirit will, will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now let us not lose heart in doing good. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So as we think about what Paul writes there, and remember he's writing to the church and he's writing to those Christians, he's telling us, you know, that we're going to reap what we sow. That if we sow good things, then we're going to reap good things. And if we sow evil things, then we're going to reap evil things. But not to grow weary. I like to tell folks that we don't have a retirement age for Christians. You know, we don't get to be, I work in the field of education and we get to retire after 28 years if we so see fit. But we don't get to do that as a Christian. God tells us here through inspiration not to grow weary that the work of the Lord continues. So when we have the opportunity that we should do good and we should do good to all people. And I think Paul points out very, very clearly here that we, especially to those who are in the church, especially to those who are in the household of faith. So we need to spend our time doing good. If we want to win the war, if we want to defeat the enemy, then we've got to spend time doing good. And we've got to do good to all and we've got to think about what God says. Paul also writes to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetousness, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. So we see there from Paul writing there to the church at Corinth that there are a lot of folks that aren't going to be in heaven. A lot of folks that aren't going to receive that salvation. All of those that refuse to be obedient to God, all of those that, that fall into these sinful categories won't be in heaven. And he even tells the Christians, he tells the Christians there in Corinth that some of you were like that. Some of you were, fall, had fallen into those categories. But look, you were washed. The blood of Jesus took away your sins. Being baptized into Christ took away those things that were wrong in your life. And you were sanctified. That's one of those big words that, that we use a lot. And all that means is that we're made holy. We're made holy because of the blood of Jesus, because of the fact that we've been, been washed in His blood, that we become holy and we're justified. You know, we're made right again and it's just if we'd never done anything wrong once we put Christ on in baptism and once we see the Spirit and have the Spirit in us, then we continue to fight this war against Satan. Paul also writes to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 3 and 18, Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in his age, he must become foolish. Uh, so that he may become wise. You know, we need to do everything that we do because we want to glorify God. We need to do everything that we do because we want God to be a part of our lives. And we have to live in accordance with His will. But as we think about Satan, as we think about the devil, for Satan, congregations of Christians always will be his first and foremost battlefront in the war against God. We must think about it, those that aren't a member of the church, those that aren't Christians, Satan isn't too concerned about. He already has them. They're already a part of his world. But those that are in Christ are the ones that need to be worried about what Satan's going to do. Those congregations of God's people is where the battle is going to be fought. 
You know, if he was bold enough to come into God's presence, and remember Satan came into the presence of God to accuse Job, and if he was bold enough to do that in Job chapter 1 and again in Job chapter 2, then he's bold enough to come in our midst no matter how much faith that we have. You know, Job was this righteous man. Job was this good man. And Satan still came into the presence of God to seek Job. So we shouldn't be surprised when Satan is in our midst. No matter how much faith that we have, no matter how, much, how many works that we're doing, don't be surprised when Satan is involved in our lives. If a congregation is active for God in bringing people to Christ, there will always be people in every stage of spiritual development in the congregation. You know, we have those in every congregation that have been faithful Christians for many, many years. And we have those that, that are babes in Christ and everything in between. So we have to realize that Satan is going to work on those that are spiritually immature. Now that's regardless of chronological age. Those that, that are young in Christ, those that are babes in Christ, are going to be more susceptible to the darts of Satan than those that have been faithful for many years. And I think that sometimes the reason that we lose our young people, and we do lose our young people at an alarming rate, I think the reason that we lose our young people is that we don't nurture them after they become Christians. I think that we baptize them and then we think we're done with that one, let's move on to somebody else. And we have to really understand that as immature Christians, they need some nurturing. They need the study of God's people. They need to be built up and they need to be edified and they need to be encouraged. So Satan uses the spiritually immature to create confusion, to create confusion in the congregation so that he can shift the focus of that congregation from bringing people to Christ to self-preservation issues. You know, we begin to think that we have to save all of our members, and the focus then becomes not on bringing people to Christ, but keeping people in Christ. And both of those things are important, and, and we know that, but we've got to realize that we have to bring others to Christ, that the purpose of the church is to evangelize and to edify and to glorify God. And when we allow Satan to have that confusion, Satan wins. Now, he only wins temporarily. You know, he so consumes the congregation with self-interest that he distracts them from God's concerns. Satan is a master deceiver. He's a master at deceiving us. He's a master at deceiving those that, that are in Christ. And we are masters at justifying our destructive behaviors. We're okay with what we do as long as we're not as bad as others. Then we justify ourselves. And the ability to Satan of Satan to convince us that we uh, should fight is astounding. Consider Paul's warning to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20 verses 28 through 31. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore be on the alert, remembering that night and day for a period of three years I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. The battle was not won. The victory was not theirs. In fact, some of the problems would be created by some of those elders. You know, it says that after my departure that wolves will come. You know, so we have to realize and we have to be warned of church folks that are going to try to draw us away from God. Those that are going to be false teachers, those that are going to be false prophets, then they're going to try to draw us away from what God has planned for us and to work with what Satan has planned for us. Again, consider John's words against Diotrephes in 3 John 9 and 10. I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first among them, does not accept what we say. For this reason, if I come, I will call attention to his deeds, which he does, unjustly accusing us with wicked words, and not satisfied with this, he himself does not receive the brethren either, and he forbids those who desire to do so and puts them out of the church. His spiritual priorities were not God's priorities. He was more concerned about what people thought of him than what people thought of God. And we get that way sometimes too. We get, we get concerned about what people think of the church than what they think of God. And he sought to advance himself at the expense of God's people. 
Now, we need to make sure that we're watching out what's going on in the church. We need to make sure that we're watching out what's going on with those that, that are teaching God's Word, that we need to be teaching the truth. You know, and we think about some other things that Paul talks about in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 through 17, and Galatians chapter 1, verses 6, 6 through 10, where he talks about division. You know, and he talks about the church being divided. This division wasn't caused by those things that were outside the church. They weren't caused by external forces that do not belong to God or produced by even a denominational approach. It centers on congregational division promoted by those who are supposed to belong to Christ. Paul anguished because of the self-inflicted wounds that these Christians inflicted on other Christians and sustained in congregations. And don't think for a minute that such behavior began and ceased in the first century and in the first century church. Christians have been wounding themselves in all ages. Now that doesn't happen by accident. It's the determined work of Satan every time it occurs. Every time a congregation is harmed, it's because of Satan. Every time that a congregation closes its doors and divides, it's because of Satan. And the only way that Satan can cause God pain is to cause his children to hurt others who are his children. Congregational division, division in the church, causes only Satan to rejoice. We never purify through division. We only destroy ourselves. You know, God looks at the church and God established the church to be pure. You know, the church that God established, this church of Christ that we talk about, this church that God established was established to be pure. And we need to remember our purposes in the church. We need to remember what God explains to us and tells us that we need to do. First and foremost, we need to glorify Him. We need to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And the things that we do have to be right in His sight. And we have to uh, edify each other. You know, we do a pretty good job sometimes of glorifying and we do a pretty good job of following through on the commands of God and forget to edify. You know, we forget to build each other up. But can God bring this messy war to an end? This war that's for our souls, this war that's for our salvation, can God bring it to an end? Of course He can. God is God. God is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. God can do everything and anything that He wants to do. He could bring the judgment right now and end it all. However, if He did, we and not he would be the losers. I don't think that we as Christians have ever realized how much that God loves the lost. Now, I think we understand that he loves the church. I think we understand that he loves Christians. But we also must understand that God wants us to be evangelists. He wants us to evangelize. He wants us to bring others to Christ. Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 25, says, But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great men exercised their authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many." So many times we want to be served. You know, God said, Jesus says that I didn't come to, to be served. I came to serve. And we must want to be like Jesus. We must want to be a servant and to serve God and to serve others. Paul writes again to the church at Rome, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us in verse 8. And then in verse 10, while we were enemies, we were reconciled. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So we're saved by being brought back into a right relationship with God. We're saved by doing what God would have us to do. Galatians 2, Paul writes in verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. God invested the life of his own Son in the lost. We were lost. We were without hope, without a Savior, without a Messiah, without Jesus. We have no hope. 
And with such a personal investment and such a large investment of His only begotten Son, God isn't going to abandon the lost easily. Thank God for His commitment to the lost, for we certainly were among them. We certainly were part of that. You know, we uh, have been lost. And if we're in Christ, now we're found. And the only way that we can stand before God is through forgiveness, not through perfection. You and I aren't perfect. If God calls all humans in judgment now, those who do not trust in Jesus, those who have not followed His commands and been obedient to Him are abandoned without hope. Then why does God not just cut His losses and destroy Satan? Of course, He has the ability. Of course, He has the authority. But I think Peter's response in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9 addresses that very issue. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God wants to bring us all to repentance. He wants the world to repent. He doesn't want any of the creation to perish, but to all have everlasting life. God offered us the path to salvation. He gave us the way. Jesus said, I'm the way, and I'm the only way to get to God. So God patiently waits for uh, so more for us to save others, to bring others into our, into our knowledge of God. Rejoice in His patience and let us unite in God's purpose. There's a war going on, and it's a war for your soul, and it's a war for my soul. And again, we know that we can be, I asked you at the beginning, what, would you do anything to defeat your enemy? We have a way to defeat our enemy. God has offered us the path to salvation. And when Satan has, is at work in your midst, never encourage him. Don't let him deceive you, and don't let him use you to assist his purposes. Always do the will of God. If you have a Bible question, would like to receive a free Bible correspondence course, would like a copy of two free books, Why I'm a Member of the Church of Christ, and Basic Bible Lessons, please contact the Nettleton Church of Christ. Speaking the Truth in Love can be viewed online. Speaking the Truth in Love is brought to you by these area churches of Christ. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing above the battle strife, Jesus saves.